Good afternoon. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm really excited that today we have John List here, a distinguished economist from the University of Chicago who is best known for his work in experimental economics, doing field experiments. He's a lot of very important insights from his work, and I think you'll see a lot of very surprising results from his work as well. We'll have time for you to ask your own questions after the presentation, so John List will present, and then I'll ask a few questions, and then you'll have a chance for your own questions, so please get your questions ready during the presentation. Um, and I know we have a great crowd here. I'm super excited that we have so many people here in person. We also have a big crowd on Zoom, I'm told, as well. So uh, again, everyone's excited about this, and I know we're going to learn a lot today. Um, so John A. List is a Kenneth C. Griffin Distinguished Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on questions in microeconomics, with a particular emphasis on using field experiments to address both positive and normative issues. For decades, his field experimental research has focused on issues related to the inner workings of markets, the effects of various incentive schemes on market equilibria and allocations, how behavioral economics can augment the standard economic model, on early childhood education and interventions, and mostly on the gen and most recently on the gender earnings gap in the gig economy using evidence from rideshare drivers. His research includes over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and several published books, including the 2013 international bestseller, The Y-Axis, Hidden Motives, and the Unders Undiscovered Economics of Everyday Life with Yuri Nisi, and his most recent book that hopefully everyone got a copy of, uh, The Voltage Effect. He has held several prestigious leadership positions and has received numerous awards. He also has served in the White House on the Council of Economic Advisors in the Bush administration in 2002-2003. Uh, thanks to the Menard family and to all of our donors for making this uh, series possible. Thanks to John List for coming here today and thanks to everyone for being here today. I'm super excited. Without any further delay, let's all welcome John List. Thanks, John. That was yeah. very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I'm going to take my clock, but you make sure to pull me off if I'm talking too much, okay? Yep. Thanks so much for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm honored to, to give the lecture, and I want to first thank the donors. I know how important donors are to institutions that are getting crushed budget-wise and financially. So I want to say thanks to all the donors and the, and the helpers and supporters of, of higher education in general. So John, that was a wonderful, wonderful intro. A lot of people in the room might have heard me say field experiments a few times or heard John say he's known for field experiments. You might wonder, what is a field experiment, and who are John's subjects in his field experiments? Let me just ask you a few questions. I want to get to know you before I have you all go through an experiment for me today. How many of you have taken an Uber or a Lyft in the past five years? Please raise your hand. Wow, pretty good. How many of you have flown United Airlines in the past decade? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have voted in one of the past two presidential elections? Raise your hand. Okay, now my research would suggest most of you are lying who just raised their hand. We'll leave that till later when we get to incentives. Has anyone not raised their hand at least once? Okay. One, I'm get, two, okay, I'm gonna focus on both, all three of you. Raise your hand if you have used Google to search in the past three years. Now I have everybody, right? Okay, we're done here. All of you 
have been an experimental subject in at least one of my experiments. So you are my experimental subjects. A field experiment uses the world as my lab. That's what I'm talking about with a field experiment. I, I can't connect you to your choice, your name or your social security number to a choice. It's not creepy like that. Okay, but what I can say is if I increase the price from here to the airport on an Uber by 10%, I can say that your quantity demanded will go down by about 10%. That's what I can say, okay? So my career has been filled with trying to use the world as my lab to make the world a better place, okay? And that's kind of where we're gonna come to with this book. Now, before I talk about the book, which I appreciate you having a copy for everyone out there, and I'm glad to sign anyone's, anyone's book at, at the end. I want to run you through just one more experiment, okay? Just one more experiment, and that's going to be what I call, let's get some neurons firing. I will be giving you a QR code in a few moments that will have a survey that you can fill out. Here's what I want you to think about. I want you to look around the room and think about an integer that is between 1 and 100 inclusive. If you choose an integer or any number outside of that range, you'll be thrown out. and You won't be counted for the average, okay? I want your integer to be what you think is two-thirds of this group's average guess. Okay? I'm an economist. I understand incentives. Your incentive is I will send you a voltage effect t-shirt in the mail. You cannot buy these in stores, by the way. And that's a demand problem, not a supply problem. Okay? Nobody wants one, so you can't, you can't buy them. I have plenty to give away. Nobody will buy them. So that will be the reward. And this fella, this is what I had up for you before. He's a winner. He's a professor down at the University of Alabama. He decided to post that picture and that saying on Twitter. I recently read the voltage effect. I'm called Econ for Everyone on Twitter if you want to follow me. And it taught me to successfully scale up from a glass to a bottle. Thanks, John. No, I'm not, that's not what the book is about, teaching that kind of scaling, OK? Now, Extra credit's important in the academy. Extra credit's important in any organization. There will be another question on that survey asking you, what is the theoretical equilibrium to that game? If you do not speak economies, what equilibrium means is once everyone chooses that integer, no one has an incentive to change. Good luck. And I will have somebody back at the University of Chicago doing the analysis. And at the end, I will announce the winners. If we have multiple winners, if there are too many, I'm just going to choose one randomly because I don't have that many t-shirts. <laughs> And I'll send one, one out randomly for the equilibrium, one out for the winning number. Okay? Look around. This is an experiment, by the way. Okay? I will be using these data for an academic paper. And I'll tell you at the end for what. And I'll link this up with how, how this has to do with the voltage effect and scaling. Okay? Then we can bring everything together. Anyone having luck getting the survey? All right. <clears throat> now, I'm asking for your email, not because I'm going to sell it or use it. It's because when you win, I'm going to have to email you later to get your home address to send the T-shirt, OK? I usually bring T-shirts along, but today I thought I always bring the wrong sizes. And then I, they just don't travel well. Do, 
do, do, do, do, do, do, do. Look around and what will they say? Hmm. John, are you feeling it? Yeah. Feeling good about your number? Yeah. Hmm. So I'll give you about 15 more seconds, and I have a lot of stuff to get through. Four eleven. I'm going to try to knock this thing out by four fifty. Okay, I'll do the best I can. Rifle through slides as fast as I can. <laughs> Says yeah, let's do it. Are you an econ major? What's your name? Fernando. Fernando. So if I have a question during this talk, can I look to you, Fernando, for help? Do you consider yourself a, a clever young man? Yeah. All right, Fernando. What's your name? Michaela, do you consider yourself a, a clever young woman? All right, Michaela. Fernando. You happy with your responses here? Michaela and Fernando, you good? Feeling like you have two winners? All right, I'll be the judge of that. Um, anybody have problem? All right, let's roll. Let's talk about the voltage effect. Let's talk about scaling. When you hear that John List is running these field experiments on the gender pay gap, or on early childhood, or on discrimination, or on why do people give to charitable causes, I think you should think to yourself, if these guys are so good, why haven't they solved poverty? Why haven't they taken a chunk out of the climate change problem? What's wrong with these social scientists? These are complex problems that we take on, but I'm here today to say I don't think we've done very well. When COVID happened, you know who killed it? The hard scientists killed it. The economists and the other social scientists didn't really help that much. We didn't even have how to scale it up and how to think about scaling. So that's what I want to talk about today. I think a big reason why we have social scientists finding great results in the Petri dish, tremendous results from small scale experiments, and then when you scale it up, what typically happens? Nothing really that good. Okay, so today, I'm going to begin by arguing that's because we have viewed scaling as an art. I have nothing against art. Art is great hanging on the wall, no problem. But when we use art to make decisions on which government programs get scaled, that doesn't make sense to me. It really doesn't make sense to me. So if you take one thing from this lecture today, I want you to take that he is trying to add science to this notion of scaling. You find something in the Petri dish, what is the science behind whether that something will work? Don't we need to know that from the beginning? Shouldn't that be a first order question before we even do the Petri dish study? Okay, let's talk about my scaling road. How did I get here and why wasn't I working on this in the early 90s when I was doing field experiments? My scaling road pretty much happened and started in Chicago Heights, Illinois. Has anyone heard of Chicago Heights in the room? What do you say about Chicago Heights? You say that, right? That's the Department of Motor Vehicles, the last time I was in Chicago Heights. Chicago Heights is a very proud community that was once a pretty rich community with great manufacturing jobs. What happened? Those manufacturing jobs left, and the community did not pivot its job base. 
Now it's a community that is literally in tatters. They came to me and they called and they said, Professor List, we need your help. They called me in 2007. When somebody like, or a group, or a community like Chicago Heights calls and says, we need your help, it's not, should I think yes or no, right? It's, where do we start? Where can I start in helping you? So we talked a lot about their constraints. Their main constraint, they have no money. They really have very little tax base. They have a community that is not well educated. They don't have jobs. Strike, 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 strike. So I said, well, let's think about starting early on. It is still an important educational, let's say, research endeavor to explore the education production function at a young age, right? What are the best ways to teach three, four, and five-year-olds? What does a skill formation process look like from birth to kindergarten? I thought if we attack that problem theoretically and empirically, I might be able to raise money to start a pre-K in Chicago Heights. So that's what I did. I raised about $20 million to start a pre-K and the pre-K started building in 2008, and this is from soup to nuts. Getting the licenses, getting the, the buses, the federally supported lunches, hiring the teachers, hiring the principal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Three goals. I want to help Chicago Heights kids. I want to produce scholarship whereby I can teach the rest of the world about what is the best way to push cognitive scores and executive function skills. I want a Perry preschool that's modern. Remember, Perry's a long time ago with 25 and 28 kids in treatment and control. And I want to create a curriculum that I can scale to the rest of the world. Not too ambitious, right? Three goals. 2014 rolls around, the results look incredible. We are moving kids from, say, the 33rd percentile, which is Chicago Heights kids, all the way up to, say, the 60th percentile between September and January in terms of cognitive test scores. We're killing it. We write a bunch of academic papers about early education skill formation. They get published in good journals. Check and check. Goal three, I want everyone in the world to have my program. I want it to scale. What do you think happens now? Take you back to my past self in 2015, and I start knocking on doors of politicians. And as John mentioned, I knew a number of them on both sides, right? I had worked in the White House. I had helped President Obama. So I knew folks on both sides. So I talked to a lot of people. What do you think they said to me? How did they greet John List with, by the way, a free curriculum? I'm not trying to sell anything. If anyone in the room wants it, it's nine binders. It's a parent academy on top of an all-day preschool. And it works very, very well. Well, here's what they said. Professor List, your program had an impressive benefit profile, but don't expect it to happen at scale. At that point, I had been doing field experiments for uh, 22 years. I had never received that criticism, ever. So I, I, I simply said, why, why do you think that's the case? They said, well, it doesn't have the silver bullet. Fernando, Michaela, can you help me here? What, is, what do they mean by silver bullet? You both claim to be smart. <laughs> Teach me. 
What does that mean? I mean, you can't just say I'm smart and then have nothing for me. <laughs> what is this? Oh, I know. I could go to Walmart and buy a box of them, right? I'm the chief economist at Walmart now. I can get 10% off with my Walmart coupon, with my Walmart card, because I'm, I'm the chief economist there. Is that what they're talking about? So I said, why? What are you, what's going on here? They said, look, John, all of the experts tell us their intervention will work, but the treatment results are never close to what they promise. That was really interesting for me because I started to think, well, wait a second here. There is a lot of information in that simple exchange that if I don't know about it as an academic who is on the frontier of doing field experiments, I worked in the White House. At the time, I was a chief economist at Uber when this was all happening. And I didn't even know that this is how policymakers viewed the world. So then I started to think about, has this idea of scaling has that been hidden in plain sight? And I started to look back at all my notes. In the White House, nearly every policy we talked about, scaling was in there. But we just said, it's kind of art. When I thought of, at Uber at the time, whenever we had an idea, and I'll talk about the ideas, some tipping ideas later in the, in the lecture, we discussed scaling. It works in New Jersey, but will it work anywhere else? It also spanned a lot of other firms that I had been working for. I, Smile Train, I don't know if any of you give or think about giving to a charitable cause. Smile Train is a great charitable cause. I've helped them raise money. United Way, Sierra Club, Philly Boys Choir, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was a thread that was about scaling. So I thought, okay, they're right. This issue of scaling is super important. Then I started to look to the experts for wisdom about scaling. And this was sort of the best example I could find about the current state of the world in scaling. You have a bunch of great math, then a miracle occurs, then a bunch of great math. I'm the fat professor pointing, saying, I think we should be more explicit in that middle part, the scaling or the miracle part, right? That's move fast and break things. Fake it till you make it. Throw spaghetti against the wall, whatever sticks, you cook it. We've all heard these nonsensical artistic statements about scaling. Look, I work with a lot of VCs. I work with a lot of private equity firms. It's art, I promise you. It's art. So then I turned to the academy, and I started thinking about where are we as a field of social scientists? Here's our game. We have an idea, we race back to our office, we write down a model. We then test the model with data. Sometimes we generate our own data via an experiment. So we measure a treatment effect. Great. If we also show mechanisms or the mediation path, we get extra credit and we get published in an even better journal. And then we go on and work on the next project. That's our world. Our world is show in the Petri dish that you're clever and you can find an intervention that works. And then we move on to our next project. That's, fair. That's a game of the academy. Now I started to think then, well, shouldn't we be from the very beginning thinking about even if that idea works in the Petri dish, will it have a chance to scale? And what are the features that I should be sure to check in the Petri dish to make sure that idea will scale. That permeates government, business, and the academy. Those simple questions. So what I did, this is 2015 now, what do I do? I turn and start writing academic papers. So I wrote several academic papers on scaling. And these are all let's say papers that are very accessible should you want to read academic papers. First one's in the AER about what can we learn from experiments. Second one, we go to the medical community. They have this problem in spades just like we do. Most of my book talks 
have been at medical schools and in hospitals. That second paper, we take from them and say, what have they learned that we can learn as social scientists? As it turns out, my wife is the fourth author on that paper, Dana Suskin. She's a surgeon. So you'll, you'll see her on a lot of these papers. At the University of Chicago, she's a surgeon. This third paper is the theoretical underpinnings for everything in the voltage effect. The concept that we use, the solution concept, is game theory. That's what all of you just did. All of you looked around and you placed yourselves in the shoes of other people in the room and you said, what are they going to do? And here's my response. That's what scaling is. You have researchers, you have government officials, you have practitioners. This is a scientific knowledge creation market that right now is broken because we are producing knowledge that works in one small setting and not more broadly. Fourth one is, this is my call to try to bring other people into this discussion. What I mean by other people, I'm an economist. I write down economic models. You might not like economics. You might not like the way economists think about problems. In this particular special issue of the journal, it's all about our economic model, but then bringing in a sociologist, a psychologist, a, a political scientist to say, what's your model? And that's what we need to do. Maybe pieces of my model will stick in the end. But in the end, we need everybody thinking about this problem. That's that special issue. And then finally, I went back to my roots, and we did an early childhood book. So we had 22 different authors talk about their programs and whether their programs could scale. OK. There are 15 other papers I could give you. We write a bunch of academic papers. Have any of you read one of these papers? And if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you in detail what you learned. <laughs> OK, no one. Okay, I think I've asked that question to about 100,000 people. Two people have raised their hands. They're the two editors of behavioral public policy. <laughs> As academics, we write academic papers. And we're lucky if two people read those papers. The editor and one of the three referees. And then we've had a good day. There is way too much scientific knowledge locked up in economies. Math. Jargon. Intellectual gymnastics. There are a lot of insights that we need to take out and write in a way that everyone can understand. That's what I'm trying to do with the voltage effect. So when you read the voltage effect, there will be no math in there. There will be no economies. There will be no jargon. There will be no Greek symbols. If you don't understand it, it's completely because I'm a terrible writer. Because it should be understandable at its very roots. OK? So that's why I wrote the book. Let's talk about the book. Policymakers said to me, look, John, you all come to us with this great thing. And when we scale it, it never works. Were they right? Do you think they were right? How many of you raise your hand if you think on that issue the policymakers were right? Raise your hand if you think they're wrong. OK. Raise your hand if you hate the word never, because they have to be wrong. All right. We have laws in economics, don't we? Right? Law of demand. That's the best we can do for laws, right? Demand curves don't always slope downward. They just, most of the time, they do. Right? That's our, that's our law. That's what social scientists do, because we deal with humans. We don't have great quantitative laws like the hard sciences have. So we have these laws that are right most of the time. Law of demand, law of supply, law of comparative advantage, et cetera. That's what we mean by never, basically, right? That's what we, that's what we say. I think I've discovered something that's as close to a law as a law of demand. That's the first law of scaling, voltage effect. 
nearly every time, if not every time, the effect sizes will change when you move from the small to the big. If you just think about benefit cost analysis, the benefit cost proposition will change every time when we move from the small to the big. Now, are there any engineers in the room? Do you hate my usage of voltage? No. You want wattage, right? What? You want wattage. Yeah. Power. Wattage is what I want. Would anyone buy a book that was titled The Wattage Effect? <laughs> to be honest, you have to give me some artistic liberty here. Now, to get you guys back in the fold, the analogy is, to me, the scaling up is a higher voltage that enables your ideas to get to more people in situations. That's higher voltage. And that's what we all want with our ideas. We all want high voltage. We want it to work even better when it scales, right? Because we always say economies of scale. OK, policymakers are pretty much right there. What about that silver bullet thing? Back to the experts, have we figured out what that means? They were really talking about a production function that looked like a best shot production function. Now, that's a lot of economies. What it really means is if you have that one great person or one great thing, Michael Jordan or LeBron or Tiger, if you're playing on a golf team, that's your silver bullet. That's what they were meaning when they were saying just doesn't have the silver bullet. Economists have made that into a theory. But they were thinking artistically, it just doesn't have the good stuff. They were exactly wrong about that proposition. In fact, scaling is quite the opposite. It's an Anna Karenina problem. Anybody help me? What, is the, what does the old man at the front mean when he says Anna Karenina problem? Any Tolstoy fans in here? You a Tolstoy fan? You like wearing t-shirts? Uh, you often do. <laughs> nice voltage effect t-shirts. OK. Here's a t-shirt on the line for you. Can you tell me the first sentence in Anna Karenina? No. Can anyone? I can't you no, know, I don't want that. <laughs> She's going for it for the t-shirt. Now that's incentives are working. Happy families are all the same, are all alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. I have eight kids. There is always somebody unhappy in my family. Tolstoy, is a, that's a great first opener. Oh, Betty Jo's calling. <laughs> but it's contentless because there are too many dimensions to it. It doesn't teach us anything. My revision of Tolstoy at least gets us somewhere. Each scalable idea is alike. Each unscalable idea is unscalable in its own way. But every time, one or multiple of the five vital signs will be out of place. That's where I'm going with this. A bunch of empirical work that I've taken part in is trying to figure out what is the DNA of a good idea? And does that empirical evidence match up with our economic theory that we've written down? And that's what I scribe as the five vital signs in the book. So chapters one through five explain chapter by chapter each of these vital signs. So I want to spend a little bit of time on each one now, but I, I won't cover all of them because again, I want some, some incentive. But the first one simply false positives. This is an extraordinarily important vital sign, especially in government circles. Over half the government policies that fail, fail because it was simply a false positive. Let's kind of unpack what a false positive means. So in, in the book, I talk about false positives coming from three different sources. One is what we learn about in our stats class, in our econometrics class. It's called alpha, statistical error. When people say, 
this is significant at the 95% level, it's admitting that 5% of the time it might be a false positive. Okay? So if everything is perfect, we're admitting that our ideas are going to be wrong 5% of the time when we reject the null just because of statistical error. Okay. That's part of the problem. A bigger part of the problem is human error. Things like confirmation bias or p-hacking or publication bias or people aren't showing their data in a correct format. They're not adjusting, for example, for multiple hypothesis testing. Add all those up and you add about 25 to 50 percent of false positive rates. Last one's human fraud. Some people just outright cheat. I talk about Theranos and our friend who said, fake it till you make it. She faked it, faked it, faked it, got caught, wasted a bunch of resources, and now she's sitting in jail. This happens in the academy, too. I talk about Brian Wansink from Cornell and his food research in chapter one. When you write a book like The Voltage Effect, it's hard to bring up the math and show alpha, blah, 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 blah. So you talk about examples. And the example I lead with is Nancy Reagan. How many of you in here have gone through the Just Say No campaign? Please raise your hand. OK. I did too. In the mid-'80s, I was in high school in Wisconsin. And these agents came in and said to us, don't use drugs. Because if you do, your brain will shrink and your private parts will shrink. I was like, yeet! <laughs> I looked at my, my teacher and I said, look, I don't do drugs, but I have a lot of friends who do, and there's no way this is going to work. There's no way this social inoculation has a chance. And they said, well, they say that they have data. So for the first chapter, I went and I dug up the data. I know where you think the story is going to go is the data were all wrong, et cetera, et cetera. They weren't. It was a really good experiment. It had roughly 1,777 high schoolers from Honolulu. Really nicely designed experiment that showed there was signal. There was a treatment effect. So what they did is they took that and they ran with it. They scaled it all across America. And then they started to realize, wow, this thing isn't working. So then they went back and tried to replicate it. It didn't work in Honolulu, it didn't work in LA, it didn't work in Nevada. And it said, Houston, we have a problem. And they stopped. And I wrote about that in chapter one. And guess, the book came out on a Tuesday. Guess who I got a call from on Thursday afternoon? There. They said, Professor List, we are not happy with your book. And I said, why? I said, is there an error? No, there's not an error, but you left an important element and piece out. The program still exists today. And they said, it works now. I said, I apologize, I didn't know that, but send me the data. Book sales are going well so far, the first two days. There will probably be addition two or three. We're on four right now. Um, I'll add five pages to the first chapter talking about the new data. Okay, so every morning I wake up and I refresh my email and I still haven't received the data yet. So if you know anyone from that group, I want to make amends. If it's there, let's change it. Right? And then what's, let's learn about why it works now, but it didn't before. Okay? But the point still shows. The book argues, let's have a few replications before we scale. That's vital sign number one. Vital sign number two I'm going to leave behind closed doors. It's about horizontal scaling. It worked in Chicago Heights, does it work in Fargo? It worked in Fargo, does it work in Madison, Wisconsin? That's what chapter two is about, okay? Chapter three is about both horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. And I start out chapter three talking about restaurants. A lot of restaurants open up and they kill it. Maybe they have a million dollars in EBITDA. And then they say, why not have 10 restaurants? or 20, or 50. 
we'd have all that extra plus economies of scale and buying inputs, we'd make even more money. So they give it a go. Some restaurants fail when they scale. Many restaurants fail. Some make it. I'm here to tell you today that if the initial success was due to the chef, that unique human, it will never scale. Unique humans do not scale. You can try to systematize it. Sometimes that works. That's what we're doing in a, with uh, Uber and Lyft, right? We're trying to have autonomous to go to the next level of scaling. We're trying to systematize the human. But we would have never gotten as big as we are at Uber or Lyft if we needed Danica Patrick and Jeff Gordon to be our drivers, right? But that was scalable to a certain extent because average Joes like me could drive. But if that restaurant makes it because of ingredients that you can buy at scale, now you have a chance. Because the ingredients or the inputs in the Petri dish are available at scale. Okay, that's what chapter three is really about. And it's about horizontal scaling, which is across input and output markets, as well as scaling within an input and output market. And that's an important point because the differences between scaling across markets versus within a market, I think can best be made if you think about Chicago Heights. I had to hire 30 teachers at Chicago Heights. As it turns out, for my program in Chicago Heights to work, I need good teachers. So is that idea scalable horizontally? Yeah, because I can find 30 good teachers in Fargo, 30 good teachers in Carson City, 30 good teachers in LA. It would work on that input. But what about within the Chicago market? What if I need to hire 30,000 good teachers? Is that idea scalable in a vertical sense? No. One, I'm never going to find that much talent given my budget. And to find that much talent, I'm going to kill the budget. So the benefit cost will dramatically change, either on the benefit or the cost side or both. Okay. Now, this ends up being an important moment for my criticism of my past self in the current way we think about social sciences. And that is, I believe we are asking and answering the wrong question when we go about our research. Today, we're doing an efficacy test. Right? A lot of you hear of A-B testing. What that basically means is, you have a group of people, you give A the sugar pill, you give B the cholesterol pill. And then you test whether A or B have better outcomes. Add a Walmart coupon, a high low price at Uber, whatever, it's A-B testing. And then we do a little bit of heterogeneity. We say are men affected differently than women. And then we go about and we publish the work. Now in essence, these are efficacy tests. Because what we do as social scientists is we give our idea its best shot to succeed. Chicago Heights, I worked on it with Steve Levitt and Roland Fryer. And the, the biggest fight I had with Steve Levitt, one of my colleagues back at the University of Chicago, is who are the teachers we should hire? So Steve said we should get the very best teachers because it's going to allow us to get in the best journal and the donor is going to be happy. That's how we do it in the academy, right? We do the best we can to give our idea its best shot. And I said, let's just hire teachers the way Chicago Heights will hire them. I won, but I was only thinking about horizontal scaling. What did I need to test for vertical scaling of teachers? I needed to hire really bad teachers, at least sample some really bad teachers. And I needed to see. Can my idea work with the kinds of teachers I'm going to have to hire at scale? I had that horizontally, but I didn't have that vertically. And that's what we don't do as academics. Because we are in the market of, I want to get the best journal possible. I want to get the biggest effects possible. So we give our idea its best shot. What I'm advocating here is to add option C 
to your original design. Do your efficacy test, A, B, but in C, add what I call critical scale features. Add reality of what you're going to face at scale. In this particular case, option C would be that's an arm that has the kinds of teachers we're going to have to hire at scale. That's option C. And in chapter three, I call that policy-based evidence. If you want to produce evidence in the Petri dish and you think you're going to change the world with it, you need to produce policy-based evidence. And that's option C. Okay? Think about this guy. Let's drive this point home. Who's that? It's more than Spock. It is Leonard Nimoy. That's Commander Spock. That's the commander. What's his genetic makeup? Half Vulcan, half NDSU economist. He never gets it wrong, ever. Well, once every seven years. That's Spock. What's that thing to Spock's right? That is a smart thermostat, isn't it? Smart thermostat. Is that what you said? <laughs> Smart thermostat. Anybody have one of those in their home? A lot of us do. I do too. When these first came out, I think Nest was one of the first on the market. The engineers estimated all of the climate change savings that these would have. Why are you laughing? Engineers taught us that if every household in America had one of those, we would take a big, big chunk out of the climate change problem. So we decided to test it. We went to Northern California and got thousands of households who wanted a smart thermostat. And we sent half of them the smart thermostat, told the other half we'll send it soon, which we did later. And then we observed their energy consumption first week, first month, after three months, six months, 12 months, etc. Guess how much energy that thing saved? What do you think? You have one of those in your house? Zero. Zero. The engineers are smart. They estimated in the Petri dish huge savings. What happened? Well, what happened is the end user was that guy. They assumed the end user was Commander Spock, the unswervingly rational, gets it right every time guy. But guess who the end consumer actually is? Homer Simpson. He does what I did. We bought one of these. My wife threw the 27-page manual at me and said, you take care of it. I opened it up, and when you get to be my age, it seems like the writing gets smaller and smaller every day. So I looked at it, threw it off to the side, and said, honey, I have this. I went in, and I undid all of the presets and the defaults. And we saved nothing. When I look at our California data, what did those consumers do? They go in and mess with the presets. And they saved nothing. You have to understand what are the features of the situation that you need in the Petri dish and make sure you have them at scale. That's chapter three. Chapter four. All of our ideas have spillovers. Some are big, some are small, some are large, some are tiny. So I start this chapter off by talking about Sam Peltzman. Sam was here, I think, some years ago, right? Giving this same lecture. Was he this fall? Sam, great guy. How many of you attended Sam's lecture? Okay. So you learned about the Peltzman effect. Perfect. 
You know the story, Ralph Nader goes on a crusade in 1965 and says, our roads are too dangerous. He convinces the federal government to put seatbelts in every new car. That started in 1968. 1975 rolls around, Sam measures. How many lives have we saved from these seatbelts? What does he find? Zero. What happened? People wearing seatbelts drove more aggressively. They were a little bit safer, but they killed the other person who didn't have a seatbelt on. So in net, you had a zero effect. That's one kind of spillover. Another kind of spillover is what happened to us at check. If you were a control kid in my experiment, and you lived nearby enough treatment kids, it was like you were in treatment yourself. That's, that's a program now that has high voltage at scale. Because when it has positive spillovers, think about Facebook. This is a good, as more people have it, the more valuable it is for us. Or unvaluable, depends on how you define some of these things, right? OK. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the last example I use in this chapter, and that's on hashtag delete Uber. Anyone remember that? That fateful Saturday night, President Trump issues an executive order on immigration. Late January 2017. Many people around America went nuts about it. The taxi cab drivers around JFK Airport in New York City went on strike. Whenever something like that happens, what does Uber do? They try to mitigate big market disruptions, so they turned off surge. The taxi cab drivers saw that Uber turned off surge. And they thought Uber was trying to break up the strike. So a particular driver went on Twitter and let the world know what he thought about Uber and ended it with hashtag delete Uber. That went viral. By Sunday afternoon, Uber's market share had gone from something like 95% down to about 70%. And Lyft had a lifeline. Lyft was rolling the white flag at that point. They were dead in the US market. My team at Uber was called Ubernomics. So if you type in John List Ubernomics, you'll see some of the stuff that we've done. Travis Kalanick came to me. Travis was the, the founder and CEO of Uber. He was still the CEO back then. He came to me and said, John, your job is to get the drivers back. So if you were in my position, my two experts, what would you have done? What's an economist's solution to everything? Pay them more money. But you don't want to just pay them. I want to introduce tipping. Remember, back then, tipping was not in the app yet. So I said, look, all the drivers want it. The customers are growing tired of having the tin cup in the back seat and then pretending to put money in there when they really didn't because they felt bad. By the way, how many of you tip your Uber and Lyft driver on every trip? Raise your hand. OK, this is amazing. I'm going to come back to all of you in a few moments. You're really a special group if you all tip so much. Um, we're going we're to get some truth to that statement in a moment. Here now. I then go door to door to the execs and say, I want to introduce tipping. We ended up winning that fight. In a company like Uber, when you win a battle like that, the booty is your team gets to roll it out. So that's what we did. Experimentally, the summer of 2017, we rolled it out and did different tests of why do people tip, how do you get people to tip more? You can think about presets, nudges, all to your mind's content. I can give you the papers, and you can read them. They're all working papers. But for our purposes, something really interesting happened in Chicago. So in Chicago, in June and July, we did a test whereby we took 5% of the drivers out of the market and said, you can receive tips. The other 95% won't receive tips. 
What happened to those 5%? They made more money and they worked more. Great, win-win, right? It's exactly what we're after. Guess what happened when we rolled it out in October to all the drivers in Chicago? They all worked more. Demand did not keep up with it. So the extra supply exactly offset the extra wages that tipping gave them. So in the end, they worked a little bit more. They drove around with an empty car a little more often, but they made exactly the same per hour as they were making pre-tipping. What happened here? A general equilibrium effect. The market came to a new equilibrium, and the idea that looked great in the Petri dish ended up looking not so great in wages when all was said and done. Those are spillovers that we need to understand when we scale something. That's chapter four. Chapter five, I'm gonna leave behind closed doors, but think about it, demand, 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 demand. What's five gonna be? Supply. supply. That's gonna be the supply side. There'll be diseconomies of scale. Think about at Chicago Heights, if we wanna maintain a high quality teacher, we're gonna be going up the supply curve. So we're gonna to have to pay more and more and more. That's why that idea is not scalable vertically. Okay, I just want to spend a few moments. Ooh, I'm really late here. Uh, no, I'm really, I, I, I'm going to, okay, let me go fast now because I want to take questions. Uh, question, Q&A is my favorite part. Chapter six, incentives at scale. So many of you raised your hand when I said, how many of you tip on Uber and Lyft every time? That warmed my heart because you're very different than everyone else. In our data, only 1% of people tip on every trip. Let me say that again. One out of 100 people tip on every trip. What about the other side? Well, the other side is three out of five people never, ever tip. Yes, I said that correctly. Three out of five people never, ever tip. Now, when I take those three out of five people who never tip on Uber and put them in a yellow cab and have them settle up at the end of the trip, now how many of them do you think tip? 95%. Those are the kinds of incentives that scale well. Social norm incentives, behavioral type incentives, et cetera. That's what chapter six is about. Chapter seven is about thinking on the margins. If you've taken a principles of econ class, you've likely heard economists are different. They think on the margin. And you might wonder, I don't even know what that means. So I talk about thinking on the margin through simple examples in chapter seven. And this happened, we talked about this at lunch. Th this happened to me at Lyft. So remember, I was at Uber for two years as chief economist. I then left for Lyft on a Friday afternoon and I started at Lyft on Mon that next Monday morning. We can talk about California state laws and non-compete laws. I was at Lyft for four years. And at Lyft, there's a team that is called the driver acquisition team. They're responsible for bringing in drivers. The two main ways they do it is they place Facebook ads or they place Google ads. And the CEO, Logan Green, gave them money and said, bring in as many drivers as you can. So they came to me with data asking me for advice. They said, okay, here's what we found so far. The last thousand drivers we've hired from Facebook ads, they cost our firm $300 to bring them in. Per driver. Per driver. Google, and it was the same quality driver. Okay, so I I'm, I'm have driver quality fixed. On Google ads for the last thousand, it cost $400 per driver. So they said, as good economists, we're going to spend the money on Facebook. Only makes sense, right? So I said, well, tell me about a, a finer splice of the data. Tell me about, say, the last 25 drivers that you brought in. Because remember, this is sequential. They said, well, we don't have that, but we'll send it to you tonight. The next, that night, I received an email that said, John, we, we have it now. Facebook, the last 25 drivers, it was $1,000 each. And Google, it was $500 each for the last 25. We wish we could go back in time and move money from Facebook to Google. The new money will now be going to Google, not Facebook. That's what thinking on the margin really means. In a world of big data, big data, big data, 
Big data is great. It gives us smaller standard errors. It gives us more information. But it leads us to think on the margin much less often. So always, whenever you can, when you see averages on some, on some presentation, if you can and you want to make a decision off these averages, try to have thinner slices of data. That's what thinking on the margin means. Okay. Now, there are a lot of old schoolers like me in here who might like me so far. But after you read chapter 8, you are going to hate me. Because I'm here to tell you that we do not quit enough. And my grandfather would roll over in his grave if he heard me say that. My dad's still angry at me for this chapter. I was raised in Wisconsin. What did Vince Lombardi say? Winners never quit and quitters never win. You start something, you finish it. Society has taught us that quitting is repugnant. No doubt. That's society's problem. Our problem is we neglect our opportunity cost of time. That's a lot of economies, but here's what I mean by that. I did a survey of recent people who have quit their jobs. And I said, tell me the 10 reasons why you quit. Reason number one, I lost the meaning of work. Right? These are younger people, so that's going to be number one. Number two, I didn't get the promotion I thought I deserved. Three, I didn't get the pay raise I thought I deserved. Four, I no longer got along with coworkers. Dot, 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 dot. I didn't like my cubicle. Not one person said, my opportunity set got better. And because my opportunities got better, I left. That's not how we're programmed to think. Experiment after experiment after experiment shows the only time we reflect on our opportunity cost or opportunity set is when something goes wrong. I urge you, in whatever you do, always renew your opportunity set and understand, if I stay here, I am foregoing doing that other activity. Okay? That's chapter eight. And there's science behind that. There's real science. It's not Vince Lombardi art. Chapter nine is about culture. John was very nice to mention gender pay gap and uh, equity, inclusiveness, fairness. I've done a lot of work on this using field experiments. And I bring all of that together in the last chapter and call it culture and how we can set up a culture from the very beginning. OK? So I'm going to stop there. And while John thinks about the questions he's going to ask me, I want to announce the winners of our experiment. Let me see if they, my faithful team has it. Ooh, OK. The target was 31. Is there a Kelvin in the room? Kelvin, stand up. Give him some love, folks. Kelvin, congratulations. <laughs> Kelvin, at the end of this, I want to take a picture with you, the other winner, and me. I don't have the t-shirts. We're going to send it to you. But you look like maybe a large. That'd be fair? Yes. All right. OK, we'll, we'll be emailing you, Kelvin. Congratulations. Equilibrium. What do you think the equilibrium was? One, once everyone chooses the number one, nobody has an incentive to change. And I'm going to mess up this name for sure. Berlin Fugile? Stand up. Did I get it right? <laughs> Berlin, congratulations, our game theorist. John Nash and John Maynard Keynes would be proud. So that game is not my innovation. It's called the beauty contest game, as you saw in the survey. That was a game that John Maynard Keynes tried years ago to sharpen his understanding of the stock market. He argued that to pick stocks, you need to reflect on what other people are going to pick. And then once you know what other people are going to do, you're in business. And that was Keynes. He, he would probably have canceled today, but what he did was literally a beauty contest. He put pictures of young women in a newspaper. And he said, choose the one that everyone else will say is the most beautiful. And then that was the winner of, the, of his beauty contest game. OK, so both winners, congratulations. We will take a picture afterwards. I would love to take questions now, John. Sounds great. I can take these from you. There you go. So I'm just going to ask one question, because I want to let uh, people in the audience ask questions as well. 
Uh, so the question I'm going to ask you is that uh, I've read that you're a very big, avid uh, collector of sports cards yeah. as a kid. Uh, baseball cards, I think, in particular, you traded with other friends. And then um, you, to get through college, you actually sold sports cards, you said. And so some of your sp first experiments were in sports cards, and I know you've done several experiments. So what are some, maybe just to give people an idea of what you can do, what you've been able to do with experimental economics. Yeah. I mean, like, what have you, what kind of insights have you gained from just doing yeah. st studies uh, in sports, sports card market? No, that's a good question. So, so thanks for the question, John. So it, it's right. In the late 80s, I was a sports card dealer. And that was a way to earn some money on the side to help pay my way through. I went to University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. So to pay my way through a point, uh, my girlfriend and I would go to baseball card shows. And we would buy, sell, and trade. And beyond making money, what I learned was I learned this principle in class. And I tried to apply it in the market. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't. So I would take those learnings back to the classroom. And I would challenge my professors about what do they think happened. I'm sure I was the most hated uh, student, for sure. We all have these students, and sometimes we suppress them. Sometimes we, we want them to grow. I'm sure I was uh, the nagging one. But from there, I started to think, could you actually use that baseball card market to learn something about the real world? Not that the baseball card market isn't the real world, but some people might say these are crazies who are paying a million dollars for a baseball card, right? Seems kind of crazy in a way. So I started working on problems like discrimination. I would send men, women, um, I would vary race, black, brown, white, and I would send them to buy items and sell items to dealers. And then I would explore, are some groups being discriminated against? And then I would explore, why is that the case? So field experiments are really good at measuring something like discrimination, but they're also very good at determining why does it happen. So economists, we have two major theories about discrimination. One is people discriminate just because they dislike the other group. They derive utility or satisfaction out of hurting somebody else. That's from Gary Becker, his 1957 uh, dissertation on a taste for discrimination. But there are other theories. For example, Arthur Pagu, a very old economist, wrote about third degree price discrimination. Some people discriminate just to make more money. They don't really care either way about who gets more or less. What they want to do is make money. Those two kinds of discrimination are affecting people differently, but the way that we attack them from a policy perspective are very different. So my argument is we can use field experiments to not only measure the discrimination that happens in the market, but also determine the underlying channel or the whys behind discrimination. And that's when we have good policies to take care of it. That's a 2004 paper in Quarterly Journal of Economics called The Nature and Extent of Discrimination. So just take that and apply it to um, cooperation, apply it to generosity, apply it to charity, apply it to gender pay gaps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you see how you can use this market to learn about the world. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and one, another paper, I mean, I'm not going to all go to the audience, but another one I found interesting was where you looked at when you actually uh, try to value something hypothetically versus yeah. when you actually buy it and now uh, people overestimate the value when, yeah, when they don't yeah. actually have to buy it. But anyway, no, but no, that's great. It, he, he's done, he's, a, he's a, good, uh, a, a very good researcher and very good student of this. So that, those are my early field experiments at University of Wyoming where there are a lot of goods that aren't traded in markets. So think about the, the Exxon Valdez oil spill. In, um, in Alaska. There were a lot of ecosystem damages, but it's very hard to put a dollar value on those. Think about the, the BP oil spill in the Gulf. Think about how we value a cutthroat trout or, or clean air 
a lot of these goods and services aren't traded and they don't have prices in markets. So economists a long time ago developed a technique called contingent valuation. And contingent valuation is a survey-based approach that asks hypothetical questions. How much would you be willing to pay for that? Would it be available? And some of my early work goes after, if you ask somebody a hypothetical question, do you get a hypothetical response? And it tries to calibrate the difference between hypothetical and real. And this is still a debate that goes on today, but those are some of my early field experiments in those markets, is trying to develop techniques, whether it's a cheap talk technique or consequentialism or what have you, what are the best ways to get values of non-marketed goods and services? Okay, thank you. Are there questions that people have? Okay, so there's someone with a mic right there. I appreciate your comment on uh, unless there's a market, you don't know what the cost is. Uh, an example, uh, back in uh, uh, the period of time when we invaded Panama, if you were transporting your personal goods in the Army and the truck went off the cliff, you were paid at 35 cents a pound. That's what it came out to wow. about. Interesting enough, when we had wrongful deaths in Panama, that's what we in essence paid those people. It came out to about 35 cents a pound. Now my question, do you have a comment on, or could you, I know chapter five wasn't covered, but yeah. could you talk about a backward bending supply curve and how that would affect your theory of voltage? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so backward bending supply curve is, it, a lot of you might have heard about these. Some earners might be income targeters. So what that means is, if I'm a taxi cab driver, I start in the morning and my goal is to make $500 today. And as soon as I make $500, I quit. That's called an income targeter. That gives you a backward bending labor supply curve. So we have tried a lot of different stories to find that creature. And we have not been able to find that creature so far. And you can say, well, wait, the whole literature, Kammerer, Thaler, uh, all these people find it. What we find is that they're, they're misspecifying the model. The regression model is the first result. And then when you do it correctly or do an experiment, it's very difficult to find it. OK. That said, if I have a backward bending labor supply curve, I like that for voltage, right? Um, in a way, I like it because it, it tells me, it gives me, I don't need wages to keep going up to get more and more people. I can actually lower wages and get more hours. So if that existed, that's like breaking the law of supply. If the law of supply didn't exist, it's really a kind of a way of saying, I can grow and grow and grow, and labor will not be an input that constrains me. Because when you're talking about backward bending, labor, we're really talking about labor supply curves, so that's really taking off that constraint. It, but there still could be other constraints, like capital constraints or resource constraints. right? I just might not have enough um, petroleum or coal or, or some kind of precious metal, uh, a specific kind of battery to expand production so much. It could be an input of capital that, that constrains me. But, but backward bending labor supply curves, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that in a way, because it kind of takes labor off the, off the equation. More of my ideas will scale then. The, the, usually the issue with labor is not necessarily the total quantity of unskilled labor. It's really the unique labor has a limit. And it's the uniqueness that's really hard to replicate. And, and then that ends, ends up being the limiting factor on the labor side. Good question, though. Other questions? Did Fernando leave the room? <laughs> he got out of Dodge, didn't he? So my question's related to the idea of um, with scaling, because uh, you were talking about between um, economists, social sciences, especially with policy, compared to, say, with the more hard sciences, how much does the idea that you can't fail as much affect things? And by that I mean, in the higher sciences, depending on what you're doing, you're usually able to do more iterations. 
With yep. a policy, when you're scaling yep. up, you kind of have one shot to do it. How much does that influence yeah, yeah. things? I, I, I think you're digging at a very important point. And let, let's talk about, there are two dimensions to this. The first dimension I want to make the point about, you could easily say, John, we don't need option C because think about medical trials. Medical trials start with efficacy tests. If it works, they didn't go to phase one, phase two, phase three, and that's them adding option C. The reason why we're different is if you start something like the Chicago Heights Early Childhood Center, there are huge fixed costs to that idea. A lot of our ideas in the social sciences, you have huge fixed costs. So if you don't do option C right away, it will never get done because the fixed costs are so great. So that's why when we followed the medical trial literature and have thought efficacy phase one, phase two, phase three, that doesn't work for us. It doesn't work because the economics of our problems are just so very different. And fixed costs is just an obvious thing that he's right. If you, start, if you set up the whole school, you should not only have your efficacy test, but you should have your scaling test too. It makes sense. Adding one treatment arm is trivial compared to having to reproduce the whole thing. Okay, so that's one first difference between what we do and a lot of other folks do. Now, where you went with the question was, once you cast an idea, it's harder to take it back. And, and I want to point out that that is an important consideration in a difference between the government and private firms. Here's what I noticed in the government. Once you cast an idea and throw it out there, people are loath to measure whether it's working the way it should. A lot of governments feels to me like they roll things out to make it as difficult as possible to measure if it's working. It's just me, but I have examples. Now, even when you find out if it's working or not, it might take a decade. By the time you find out, guess what? It's probably working for a small group of people, and it's also working for the small group of rent seekers who are making a bunch of money, whether they're providers or, or recipients in some way. Now it's really hard to take that back. In most of the private world, that I've, and I'll, I'll give you a caveat in a moment, but usually in the business, you try it, it doesn't work, you bring it back. It just didn't work. We're not making money, so we don't have that product anymore. In government, very, very hard to take it back. Now, that's why I advocate that in government, we should be sunsetting everything. We should sunset, and we should say, here's what you need to do to show that your program's working. And if you're not able to do that, why, are we, why do we continue? We continue because there are lobby groups that jump in and continue the nonsense. So I, I think that that's one important difference. Now, in private firms, there was one example that I talked about today that we knew once we cast that idea, it will be impossible to bring back. And that was tipping. We knew that once we put tipping in the market, even though I can show the drivers all kinds of data that says you're not making any more money. Some of them are. Right? The people who receive high tips are. It's just that some are making negative and a lot are making zero from it. But it will be impossible to get that back. So we knew that at Uber, and we were especially careful about making sure we got that right. For example, one constraint that TK said, Travis Kelnick said was, John, I want the percentage of trips that are tipped to be between 10 and 15%. He said, that's your goal. Because I don't want this to be like restaurants where it's a tax. He said, if we want a price increase, there are better ways to raise prices. I don't want to raise it through a tip that everyone thinks they have to pay. So my goal then was to produce a product that would yield 10 to 15% of trips being tipped. It's exactly what that product did. The key is you have to separate the tip decision in space and time from the trip. The minute you separate 
the customer from the driver and, and said, you can only make the tip decision when you get in your house or you know, after the trip is concluded and the driver rates you, then you can tip. That was a decision that we made so it wouldn't be a social norm that every trip was tipped. Okay, does that answer your question? Awesome. Awesome. Other questions? And look, you can ask me about anything. Walmart, Uber, Lyft, the book. Go ahead, boss. All right. So, a great presentation. Thank so, you. I, I have a question. I'll say the word IRB, but I'll yeah, also the, say, say the word um, our incredible sense of how it needs to be fair. And when you said that 5% of Uber drivers were set up with a tip and the other 95 were not, yes. I, I couldn't believe that there was not a huge backlash from individuals. So can you talk about where, if you're experimenting, you're treating yeah. some people differently than others. Yeah, let's talk um, about Has that gone yeah. wrong at all? Or? Let's talk about that, because this is an important point. I'm writing a book, a PhD book on experimental economics right now. Chapter, 17, it might be reconfigured, but roughly around chapter 17 is a chapter on the ethics of, of experimentation. And I begin with the Belmont Report. And, and I talk about, as experimentalists, what, are, what do we have to live up to and what should we aspire to? All of this work has IRB approval, so we can start there. But that's not enough. IRB will approve things like Milgram's old old work, right, where you have people shocking another person. And then later we say, well, you weren't really shocking them, but you just shocked yourself that, that entire time in a way. Um, I always strive for making sure that nobody is made worse off through the experiment. When you take 5% out, out and they work a little bit more, the other 95% aren't made worse off. So if you have a counterfactual world of nobody can be made worse off, and all you can do is make people better off, not only in expectations, but also in real outcomes, these are the types of ideals that I'm putting in that chapter. So when I wrote a, a paper for, for the magazine Science, it was titled, Homo Experimentalist Evolves. And I talked about natural field experiments, exactly as I talk about them here. People are taking part in an experiment without knowing it. We do this all the time, but should scientists be doing this? And I talk about versus informed consent. So informed consent, let's face it, is you're in a medical trial and you're told you might get the good stuff. And by the way, you might not, and if you don't, you can't go and get another medication. That would be like me in Chicago Heights telling the, telling the families, you might get this, this program from me, but if you don't, you can't go and get anything else if you sign this informed consent. I never do that. In Chicago Heights, if you were in the control group, I helped them get alternative treatment because then that was my counterfactual that I'm comparing my results against. Okay, so I don't think just because you sign informed consent that that gives you liberty like, like is done. Now, a natural field experiment, of course, doesn't have informed consent. When all of you signed up for Uber, it does say there might be experimental prices. On Uber and Lyft, 10% of the prices that are given are experimental prices. So they're doing experimentation whether John List is there or not. But when I enter the firm, I say, I want rule number one, nobody can be worse off from my experiment. That's stronger than the Belmont Report, and stronger than IRB will demand. But I think those are the kinds of, let's say, ideals that we need to set up. In, in economics, we also can't deceive people. In psychology, a way that they get around experimental demand effects is they practice deception. I'm not gonna make a normative statement whether that's good or bad. I'm just telling you in a positive sense, those are the differences between the two. The way that I get around experimental demand effects is I do a natural field experiment. You're in an experiment, you, you, you might give to Smile Train. So Smile Train will tell me in the month of September, we're gonna allow you to send the letters rather than us. So you, you were gonna get a letter anyway, I just changed the contents of the letter. That's a natural field experiment in the stuff that I do. But it, it deserves, 
as a consequentialist, I'm on very firm ground, but I could take a different uh, philosophical view and I could be on soft ground. And I could be on harder ground with informed consent. But I, I think that this entire conversation needs to be had. I think the biggest bomb is around data protection and privacy issues rather than did I get a letter that had one more sentence in it or not? I think the real issues that we're going to face as a society are going to be around privacy. And, and I've begun to think about those issues and what's happened with Facebook and Google and Amazon, and it's happening more and more. That's, that, that to me is going to be, a, they're all first order issues, but I think the privacy one is, the, is, is in my mind the, the, the first, first, first order one that we need to handle. So since, since we're almost out of time, I'm just going to ask one last question because this sure. is a question that I'd like, uh, I, we'd like to, all of our speakers to answer. Uh, there's a lot of students here, and so you've been very successful yeah. in economics. And I'm just wondering you know, if you can give advice to students yeah. on what they can do for, not necessarily in economics, but just for their yeah, future yeah. careers yeah. to be successful, if you have advice. For okay, them. so I appreciate those kind words that you think I've had some success. So uh, I'm going to give you advice about what I've learned. Let, let's do that, because I've, I've been around a fair number of uber successful people. I've had, I've had a lot of good luck that way. And they all share a collection of features. For example, one feature is every person in this set of what I would term highly successful people is monomaniacal. So think about Travis Kalanick. He ate, drank, and slept, transforming urban transportation and how I can get people around cities in a more efficient way. Think about George Bush, President Bush, or, or uh, Senator Clinton. When I worked with them, they also had their objectives, and they were monomaniacal about those objectives. Number two, these people understood comparative advantage. And comparative advantage is a concept that takes some self-reflection to figure out what are you good at and what do you love. And they did that. And then they hired team mates and people to be around them who had a different set of skills or different comparative advantages than them. And they established this team that can end up working. Our first instinct usually is to hire, it's, it's homophily, right? Hire people who look and act and talk like us. That's the worst type of person you want to hire. You want to hire a person who says you're wrong at every turn. That can get dismal in a while, but when, if they're right half the time, you're in really good business, right? So they understand comparative advantage. Another thing that they understand is how to use science and how to use data to get at things that they don't understand. They understand optimal quitting rules, and they understand when to pivot. When to pivot is not, a, is not an easy question. You know, a lot of times people ask me, well, how do you know when it's time to quit? If your opportunity set is so much better than what you're doing right now, and it's a sure thing, don't just chase a dream that might be around the next corner and quit something. But if there's something real there, it's clear. Your opportunity set suggests you should quit and pivot. If we would have just called it pivot from the beginning rather than quit, we would all do it a lot more. Because quitting has this kind of heavy feeling that you're just going to go sit on the couch and watch Days of Our Lives all day. And that's really not what people mean when they mean <laughs> quitting, right? Ambitious people mean I'm going to pivot to something new, right? That I'm not going to keep digging down the same dry hole. So I think these are just some of the features that the uber successful people have shared. And, and those are people who really make it. It's, whether it's Jim Heckman or, or Sam Peltzman or Gary Becker or Milton Friedman, um, these are all people who, if you set up those four or five ideals that I just summarized, I think all of them would have those in spades.
Awesome, yeah. Yeah, so a great example is that you're going to be a professional golfer and <laughs> And we don't view you as a quitter because you're not yeah. you're not golfing. <laughs> you clearly my dad my dad golf and, and golf coach might, but, yeah. but <laughs> I'm glad that you don't. <laughs> so anyway, thanks again. This thanks. has been thanks excellent. We me. really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was Good. really awesome. Thank really, you. Really appreciate Sorry it. Sorry for going too long. No, I no, clock, not I at like, all. It was great. I, I, I was like, oh my I gosh. I've been listening to you forever, so it was really great. So it was awesome. Good.